traders come into come into trading and they just have this optimism they that they're going to succeed they're going to they're, they're going to they're going to be the one that and the truth is the casino knows that 98% of those people are going to be uh, dead they're going to be out of the markets in 5 years they're going to burn through their capital and yet that bias is still there Welcome to Trade Happy. Welcome back to another Traders Podcast episode. Remember guys, if you are enjoying this series, hit the like button, comment below what you've learnt from this episode, and subscribe. Today's trader is a psychologist and has been helping traders with psychology for over 15 years. He's wrote a book titled Trade the Markets with Edge, and he also mentors traders with their own trading. Please welcome Randy. So for anyone that doesn't know who you are, can you just tell us a bit about yourself? Hmm. Well, I am a therapist who uh, specializes in building performance minds. And my interest is uh, literally from a neurobiological perspective of how the brain creates mind and how that mind interacts with uncertainty. Uh, That's my basic work. And I came to traders simply because they're fascinating. Uh, They deal with uncertainty uh, all the time and they understand at some level, the the ones who really begin to evolve, understand that they have to be able to go and change the way the brain interacts with uncertainty in order to be able to move from basically getting hijacked to where you have a probability-based mind that can engage with. And I came, I, you know, I just came from the, um, started out as a therapist and ended up in, in human potential. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. So how did you go from the therapy side to the trading side? Well, it was very interesting is that um, I was getting bored. Um, it's what ultimately what you're, what you're, really finding in the therapeutic clinical side is that people want their problems to go away. They're not really looking to develop their potential as a human being. That's not, that's not why they're in your office. And uh, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we've got these big, huge, giant banks and the technology that supports them all. And a lot of my clients really were more interested in peak performance and the development of potential. And I was just, I'm actually much more prone that way myself. And then one day I, uh, I'm talking to a guy and he's saying he's having performance problems in his business and I asked him what his business was. And it was a hedge fund. He was a partner in a hedge fund. And I started working with him and found it really fascinating. And it was just absolutely that you, there was no way that you could not uh, have to change the way the brain operated in the, in that soup of randomness and the actually acknowledge the illusion of control, all that stuff and this whole need to think you have to win. And it, it was a process of where, you know, I saw him grow and uh, then he started referring people to me. And before I knew it, um, um, here I am, you know, and I, I found that, you know, from my perspective is that I've, I got all these incredibly great guinea pigs as clients that I can I just can experiment with and work with and explore. And uh, I've learned an enormous amount about how our potential as human beings are shaped. And uh, I just find it completely fascinating. So there you go. Yeah. And you mentioned that you work with that hedge fund. Um, are you able to like share some of the problems they had or how you solve those problems with um, coming from your side? So not the technical side. You know, ultimately it's the same thing. I'll give you an example that's happening right now with a client of mine is that he's a, an enormously successful, he trades other people's money. He has that whole thing. And, uh, with this COVID outbreak and the, uh, the impact it's had on economy and just the, the violence of the swings, uh, he found himself, um, having a hesitancy to actually enter into the perfectly good, perfectly good valid setups. And his clientele was saying, look, I want to tell you something. If this money disappears, it disappears. We gave it to you and your job is to trade it. 
but he found himself um, really concerned about losing their money. And it started impacting, you know, that, that gnawing, that gnawing anxiety and started impacting his capacity to act from a probability mindset. And he started getting worries that he was nervous and couldn't enter, couldn't enter positions. And from there, you know, it's uh, a lot of it, it. You have to go back and you have to recognize, oh, that's anxiety projecting into the future with the negative, with the negative future. And you start going back. It's what is the belief, you know, bes besides the regulation of being able to interrupt the emotion of anxiety, you know, ultimately, ultimately an emotion is composed of a number of different parts. And I'll tell you what, it, it may be better to even explain for me the kind of work I do. An emotion is not psychological at all. It's not, um, it's not of the mind. Uh, an emotion is actually a biological action potential. It's bio it's biological. And its function is to coordinate action between the environment that the organism's in, that would be trader to market. And the moment there's a change, a perturbation in anything in the, in the markets there by definition is a triggering of emotion. And that emotion uh, has a firing sequence where it first in the triggering, it starts arousing. That's where it's revving up, getting ready for it to move the organism into action. Then it gets to a switch that goes on where it's no longer revving up but you begin to have the feeling of the emotion. That's actually the chemistry of the emotion in the body and the brain altering the way you think. And that's what's happening with this guy, David, is that he sees the potential, it's a, there's a perturbation, you know, and all of a sudden, boom, an emotion emerges and he's been a little spooked by the, the just the craziness of the markets. And he doesn't want to lose people's money. He's and yet, you know, this guy's got 35 years of experience under his belt. But the the next thing that once that feeling is there, the emotion, it's called emotional motivation. And that's attack, avoid, or approach. Most people know that as fight flight. And it starts it, the, the power of that emotion starts taking you out, and that's when it takes over psychology. At the same time, there is a belief or what we what we'd actually call an implicit limbic belief that's not that most people would call subconscious it's a it's a learning that the limbic system's done and it's not verbal so you're not going to have thinking about it it just does and but that belief is going to it's always about your capacity for managing the uncertainty that you're engaging and you're seeing you're seeing that happen and there's also that genetic predisposition where sometimes, you know, some, some guys in trading have won the genetics lottery. The vast majority are just typically wired. But what, what you basically discover, particularly when they're running with stuff like that, is that a lot of the same things is um, I worked with a market analyst who became uh, a portfolio manager. And the problem is, is this whole position was to be right when, we, when he went in as an analyst to talk uh, people into buying a product he wanted to, them to think he was right ultimately he brought that frame of mind into into the business of portfolio management and because of that he ended up doing some dumb stupid things and would have major uh, losing days because he he wouldn't give up he wanted to be right even if the market was telling him that he was not right so a lot of it's the same things and uh, there's actually, to be honest with you, there's actually a uh, there's actually a tendency for um, there's a great book, The Hour Between Wolf and Dog, where um, it was a derivatives trader who became a neurobiologist, and basically what he was saying, what he was saying is that hold on a second, I uh, I have a cat who is going to start making a bunch of noise if. I don't do what he says there. Um, but anyway, the, the thing is, is that what you discover is that in a lot of these floors, what you would notice is that they would get all jacked up before a major news event and stuff like that. And their bodies would go into this fight, flight, aggressive type of stuff. And 
they may have a great year. They may make the company $50 million that year. But if you look at it over five years, they lose money. And yet the guy who's steadily making $10 million a year uh, at the end of five years, he's, he's, he's made the company $50 million rather than one year, $50 million and lose $50 million over the next four years. So you see, you see that running all the way through. And it's also why trading is generally a young man's sport because somewhere you just kind of get aged out and you just begin not to want to take all those risks and just want a saner life. You spoke a lot about uh, many different things just then. Um, but there's a few things that I want to kind of go over again um, in a bit more detail. So mm -hmm. the first thing is how can the average trader develop their, I'm sure it's not this word, but the unconscious thinking that you were talking about? Well, to become aware of it, I think, is a, a much better position, and particularly become beginning to develop an awareness of uh, the biases that are organic in nature, like uh, optimism bias, a bias. I mean, traders come into come into trading, and they just have this optimism they that they're going to succeed. They're going to they're they're going to they're going to be the one that. And the truth is, the casino knows that. 98% of those people are going to be uh, dead. They're going to be out of the markets in five years. They're going to burn through their capital. And yet that bias is still there. That And that bias, until you understand, oh, that's a bias, and it's built into my evolutionary psychology, you can't see it. It's just operating on what we call an implicit level. And you have to start seeing it and beginning to realize, oh, my God, this is not positive thinking. This is a bias that I have that is not effective in the evolution of a trading mind. Is, you know, your job is to manage randomness and your job is to become an incredibly good loser. Okay. And when things do happen on a, on a random or in a, with an edge to that randomness, when they do fall on your, your side of probability, that means you have a win. You begin to recognize that I only landed on the right side of probability relative to me. It wasn't necessarily uh, all skill that did that. There was skill, yeah, but there was also just the luck of the draw, the randomness. But you've learned how to accept that this is uh, that anything can happen at any time, and your desire to be right, your desire to be in control, again, biases. Uh, simply have no business operating on implicit unconscious level in the trading mind. And probably where it really starts is uh, most people are blown away. Uh, I have people, uh, I, I like them to either have a good sized mirror or have a video feed on themselves so they can watch themselves trade. And they are, they are generally blown away to find out how tense they are how much you know their jaw their fist their you know their gut and how little breathing they're doing they'll be holding their breath they'll be breathing very high in their chest and those are these are all biological elements of emotional arousal i mean you're literally the body is preparing for fight flight and you're already getting cranked up which means that your thinking is really skewed is already compromised and you don't even see that it's compromised. So where it starts, where you start developing awareness, start developing uh, literally access to um, what we'd call subcortical material, that implicit, the implicit limbic learnings, is you start watching your body. And then you start noticing and what, what your trading account's telling you. You know, because you know, fundamentally, your trading account is telling you what beliefs you're bringing to the management of uncertainty. That's what that trading account is doing for you. If you have, if you have an established edge in probability. So it kind of begins there. It's in from there though, is that um, part of it's intellectual and a lot of people will read my work and think they get it. Uh, and, uh, and I, I see that on YouTube all the time. I see that from my articles. I, I get a lot of comments about that. And 
at the same time, what I understand is this is this is more than knowledge. You can't just have knowledge like from a textbook. What you have to develop is competence, emotional competence about really truly understanding the way the brain works on uncertainty. That's the that's the big, big thing is and then to actually start developing the emotional intelligence to to recognize that you actually can have a big say so about what emotions show up or what emotions are summoned as you engage uncertainty. And that is what you do control is you can you can you can build a mind as you get to know yourself that maintains discipline and partiality in the midst of engaging uncertainty. And that's the mind that that's the mind that performs well. Uh, it doesn't necessarily win or lose. It performs well. And if you have an edge, that increase in performance is going to also show that you're, that you're taking more capital out of the markets than you're giving back in. Yeah. Um, so I guess leading on from the uncertainty in the markets, how can a trader that's sitting home right now retrain their brain to deal with the uncertainty in the markets? Hmm. Well, first of all, there's just very simple stuff. You start you start a um, mindfulness practice. That's where they're... And you start recognizing that, okay, uh, this is a lot about breath. You start doing the... the the emotional regulation work. Whereas the first thing I teach when, when I'm working with a person, we don't get into the head. What we're doing is we're working from the body and they start retraining the way the body responds to uncertainty. And that's something that can be done, done at home. You can go to YouTube and learn how to breathe. I mean, they'll have plenty of videos uh, where literally you're learning to breathe diaphragmatically. Because I mean, ultimately, the thing about breath is that um, it's such a major part of an emotion. Is something like anger, something like fear, cannot coexist with diaphragmatic breathing. Is uh, it anger and fear require higher lung? Uh, that you're, you're only using the top thirty of your lungs because you know from the body's wisdom, it says you know something. I'm about to fight or flee from a situation. I don't need the extra oxygen to send to the brain to think. So what it's doing is saying, I just need to get these big muscles oxygenated and that can be done with a third or a half of the lung capacity. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing that a lot more rapidly and I'm, I'm able to see or uh, flee or fight. That's the very first thing is you learn how you learn that the way you've been breathing has been hindering the way you emotionally engage the uncertainty of the markets. And from there, um, one of the most powerful things is the next step is that you start developing mindfulness. And understand breathing as a technology has been around for about 4,000 years. That's what those Hindu yogas were doing. Mindfulness as a practice has been around since the Buddha, 2,500 years. So this is not, this is not wild new information. This is not intellectual property information, but in mindfulness, what you're, what you're doing is you're becoming an observer to thought and belief rather than uh, a participant in the thought and belief. And then you begin, oh my God, my thoughts and beliefs and I are different from one another. And then you start going, oh my God, I'm not even having thoughts and beliefs. They're having me. And you develop that awareness of going, oh my gosh, I can actually, by stepping back out of those thoughts and becoming an observer to thought, an observer to my beliefs, you you discover really quick that it's much slower for, for that emotion to grab you and to sweep you away. But those are the two things that I, I consider those to be the, the core, the core pieces that have to be accomplished before you really at, actually start working with the beliefs that lay in the mind. Um, but to get that, to get those elements done, uh, it's powerful and anybody can do it. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a, a guy that I watch quite a bit called uh, Wim Hof. I'm not sure if you know him. Um, he does a lot of breath work and stuff like that. Um, but do you think that there's any routines that can help traders with their psychology? Oh, oh absolutely. I um, 
I'm very much a routine type of guy. It's that uh, when I work with when I work with traders, they end up building a psychological trading plan that dovetails into their methodology plan. And you know, from my standpoint, what you need to be looking at is literally a trader needs to be watching the way he actually gets ready to sleep. Uh, a lot of the guys that I work with will start out literally by watching their smartphones, uh, an iPad or a computer screen or the TV and then turn the lights out to go to sleep. And what they don't recognize is that they have just stimulated the heck out of their visual cortex and it's going to take 30 to 40 or more minutes just to calm the excitation out for you to be able to get down into good sleep. So it starts with a good night's sleep because if your brain's not rested, the mind that you're going to get out of the, uh, that brain is is not up to the task of being highly effective at managing uncertainty. It's, it's got to be there. You start there. And to me, every trader ought to have a process that he's going through in the morning that would, um, I, I, you know, I, I teach mindfulness uh, meditation as part of getting ready. And then what we're doing is also what you in, in the mindfulness, what you're also doing is you're, you're looking for, um, any residual, uh, emotional content that you have not addressed, but and a, a lot of particularly, um, traders who are trying to evolve, they end up having, um, dread in the morning before they even get to their trading room. And by the time they, they bring their machines up and their charts starts up and stuff like that, They've been trying to ignore this emotional content that they that they've been pushing, trying to keep out of keep out of sight, keep out of awareness, thinking that it would go away. And the truth is, is you need to attend that before you start taking your brain and throwing it into the management of uncertainty. But there there has to be there. There should be, I should say, a process that allows you to get into that um, much better mental state. And again, it starts with the mindfulness. And, you know, for me, I'm, I'm not necessarily teaching positive thinking. I, I think that's dangerous, um, but it's really more the, the, uh, the receptivity and the readiness to be able to risk capital. That's, that's the, that's really the aim. And for me, you know, I, I have a, um, whether or not in neurobiology, we would call it, um, spheres of influence. Okay. And, and, um, it's, uh, other people call it voices in the mind. Uh, I think it's essential for a trader to get to the moment where he can step back and observe this dialogue that's going on inside his head. Uh, because um, whether or not you're just looking at it as brain regions that are in competition with one another or in cooperation with one another or different forces in the mind, I use the analogy of uh, the committee of the mind and in it what i what i ask them to realize is that there is a struggle going on that committee where there are very destructive elements within that committee and very constructive elements within that committee of the mind and they need to wake up and as they wake up they realize that they have a very uh they have not been managing the mind they have not been managing uh what voices have a say so in their head as they trade and out of that, you know, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a trader to be able to develop um, from memory, from actual experience, the ability to, uh, to maintain discipline as a, an emotion, to maintain courage, to be able to face fear, to be able to maintain a sense of self-soothing. Um, that means calming your fear down and stopping this idiot way of, uh, of, cursing yourself out and beating yourself up when you make a mistake is that you just make the problem worse. I've never, I've just never met a trader where after a good self bashing, he's a better trader. You know, if you've just taken a loss, you need to be comforting yourself and getting yourself back to where you can actually learn from that loss. Um, but you have a series of things like that. And, yeah, you know, that's what I teach for a living, how to do that, how to develop those elements of the self. Because ultimately you want to calm the fear down, and which by the way, I, I call the orphan, uh, that fear or aggression that, uh, that wants to prove itself. Because ultimately this is really all about recognizing that you're going to have to re-mentor the self 
to be able to develop it for something that evolution did not design it for. You know, it designed a mind, a brain, to have control, to be right, and to literally live in that illusion. And uh, you, um, you have to train the mind very differently to realize that you don't control outcome, not at all. But what you do control is the mind that you bring to the moment of performance. And that's what, Jacob, that's what people keep missing. There is enormous, enormous power in recognizing where you actually do have control and where you don't. And again, it's, I visualize, I visualize trading is actually like a three legged stool. You have your platform, you have your methodology, your way of managing risk, and you have your trader psychology. And if you look at trader psychology is more like the driver of a racing car is that uh, it's essential to get to get that racing car to perform at its highest te technological level, the driver better be very competent. You know, if you put me in a Formula One car going 200 miles an hour and there's going to be trouble. OK. At the same time, there are there are guys who are very well trained who who can run that machine and go around curves and just they take that. God knows how much Formula One car costs. Take that machine and that technology, and God, it's a beautiful thing to watch. And it's the same thing with trading: is that you know you, you have to get those three interlocking pieces, platform, methodology, and trader psychology, working together. And ultimately, you have to have you have to become a detective, and you're out trying to solve the crime about what are the beliefs that I'm bringing to the show, and your trading account is not going to lie to you. It's going to keep telling you there's something wrong about the beliefs, or it's going to be telling you something's really right about your beliefs that you're bringing to the management of uncertainty. And you start drilling down. And from my standpoint, the good news is this is not rocket science. If we don't, the, the beliefs that we're, uh, that, uh, that are limiting our ability to effectively manage uncertainty, are pretty simple uh, and it's a sense of inadequacy I can't do this a sense of uh, not mattering for who you are if I make a bunch of money if I'm a if I'm a winner boy uh, people see who I am it's not it's not inherent worth though and the other thing is worth is a lot of people to be honest with you they really honestly at the very core level they don't believe they deserve to make easy money and it's, it's a big thing and then there's also the scarcity thinking of holding a belief that what you have can be taken from you. Um, scarcity thinking is a big component with problems in trading. And the last one is the experience of powerlessness, is that if you've ever gotten into a trade and that thing just started beating up on you and just going sideways on you, going crazy on you and going against you, and you felt powerless, you, you know exactly that... Um, uh, that's a belief that I am powerless to, to manage what I can manage. I can't manage winning. No, you can't. But you can manage the mind you bring to the struggle. That's that's the big deal. So anybody can do that. Hmm. Yeah. Easily more, e more easy said than done. That I will say that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so from all your experience, what's something that sets profitable traders apart? from the non-profitable traders performance is that the uh, the profitable traders have recognized it's not about the money it's about the performance and uh, again it's about what you can and you cannot control if you're out um you know the thing that draws people into trading in the first place is suddenly they look at it and they realize oh my god a lot of money can be made boy i can make a lot of money and i can win money and then they think oh it's the personal freedom too you know, because uh, yeah, I can imagine working an hour and a half, three hours, maybe four hours a day and, you know, and not having to report to demand and being my own boss and having a different life. Those two those two drives are big, but there is a flawed logic to it is that, you know, you, it's not about winning and losing. It's about performing. And one of the hardest things for a trader to do is to retrain the mind and his beliefs about 
recognizing that when you win, you just, all you really did was land on the right side of probability relative to you. If you're performing well, if you lose, all you've done is landed on the wrong side of probability relative to you. And all you have is this edge that gives you a slight statistical advantage in the way those probabilities fall. That's the mind that you have to build. It, it has to go beyond winning and losing. It has to be really focused on, on your performances. It's kind of like if you take a look at golf and you realize that on the LPA, L, PGA Tour, there are lots and lots of people who can drive the holy heck out of the ball. There's lots of people who can putt really well. But at any one time, there's only about 10 big time money winners in golf. And what you, what you realize at, at literally at that masterly level, what you realize is that you can't control outcome. You can't control if another guy's having a great day. You can't control the fans that are yelling and screaming. You can't control the weather. There's, there's the lay of the land. But what you can control is the mind that you're bringing to the moment of putt. That's what you can control. And that's that, that's the edge. That's the edge that a master golfer and I might add a master trader is going to have as they've come to that moment of where they realize it's not about winning or losing. I'll give you an example from trading is, um, a friend of mine, really good trader. Um, in his teaching, uh, he will, in his, the group that he works with, he has three different la um, levels of traders where, you know, they can only do set trades. And then as you gain more skill, uh, th th they expand it to what I would call uh, A and B trades. And then he also, David also would do uh, intuitive trades where he doesn't know why he's there. There's something there. He knows something without not, without knowing how he knows it. And a couple of months ago, he was saying, Randy, I got into one of these intuitive trades. And as I got into it, I realized that my intuition just was not good. And what I did is I got out at a small loss. Meanwhile, a number of other people had gone in to that same trade. And the next day they were talking about it. And I said, oh, you should have gotten, you should have stayed, man. I'll tell you something. That's, that just absolutely, it was a, it was a monster trade. It was the, it was the trade of the month. And David's response was, it, it didn't fit my methodology. I'm not, I'm not going, I'm not going to stay in a trade that doesn't hit, doesn't hit my markers. And he just got out. It wasn't anything to him. It was really all about performance. It wasn't about, it wasn't about whether or not he was going to win or lose. So that's the, that's the big thing. And that's what separates profitable, profitable traders from guys who keep wanting it because the moment that you have to win, uh, or claw back for God's sake, you know, revenge trade. What you've done is you've given the casino <laughs> power and control. Yeah. That's what you've done. Yeah. And you just kind of touched on the discipline that that trader had. Um, and do you have any advice for someone who does struggle with the discipline or the patience when trading their plan? Well, it, um, Jacob, it starts with emotional regulation is that um, that emotion is going to sweep you away if you don't manage it. Manage just the biology of it. That's the first thing. And what I also recognize is that when you can emotionally regulate the emotion, that doesn't mean it changes your performance. But the thing is, is you don't get to the mind if you can't, if you can't manage the intensity of the emotion so that it sweeps you away. But once you're, what you're really doing on, on discipline is that you are looking, I use a process called memory enrichment, where we go back into a, a, uh, a person's memory of a, when they were challenged and they were scared, but somehow this time they were able to push through it and land pretty good. And what I'm, what I'm doing there is, um, in what we call memory, we like to think that we, that we like that memory really happened. Well, it didn't. Uh, what a memory really is, is a brain encoding an experience. Okay. Based on its biases 
And th these are the implicit biases that you don't know you have that are just absolutely controlling you. And it will take parts and elements of that experience and encode them into memory. And once that encoding is done, you think that's what's happened. At the same time, the brain has missed a chunk of uh, basically what actually took place in that memory, in that experience. And what I'm doing is uh, I'm getting people to go back into experience like that and deconstruct that memory back into experience and find the actual discipline that was there that if they didn't have the discipline in those circumstances, they would have been able, never been able to maintain the order of the self to push through the experience. That's the, that would be the big difference between the use of affirmation, the use of visualization and memory enrichment. We're actually going to something that did in fact happen. It's it, it, you did it. So it's not like something you're trying to make up and fake it till you make it. It's not something you're trying to make believe and bring into reality. It's something that did in fact happen. And ultimately what you're doing is by being able to focus on that, you can find the feeling state, the chemistry of the discipline. And remember, discipline is an emotional program. That's what it is. And you're literally learning how to summon the feeling state of the emotion and that's the, that's the magic Jacob is that all thinking is emotional state dependent. And what I'm doing is I'm teaching a person how to go in, go and use memory, deconstruct it and then reorder that memory, not making it up. You're just reordering it, recognizing that, Oh, well, discipline, courage, self-soothing and impartiality did th clear thinking did in fact have to occur in that experience for me to have gotten through it the way I did. And it may be an unusual experience for you. It may not happen very often, but all we're trying to do is say it's on the, it's on the genome. So we know it's there. You've experienced it. Now what happens is we need to start promoting and nurturing that voice within the self, that emotional program within the self and pulling it forward so that it becomes what, what I call an, an acting partner in the mind rather than the historical one that you came stock with. But that's, you know, that's how I teach it. That's how, um, that's how, you know, like I said, that's, that's how I teach it. I'm, I'm looking for the direct emotional experience of the discipline. And from there, your, your thinking becomes disciplined because all thinking is emotional state dependent. At the same time, you have to have the courage to be able to face your fears. And to me, that's one of the biggest things in, in trading is that people, Guys just, uh, you know, they, they can drive big old huge honking pickup trucks and they can do all this other stuff and look manly. But the truth is they don't have the, uh, they don't really want to look at themselves and trading forces you to look at your fears and it's not like you're going to conquer them. You have to master them. So the second part to me is recognizing that maybe you've gotten away with not having to deal with your fears. Uh, so far in your life, but in trading, you're not, you're, you're going down to the most fundamental property of literally our caveman brain interacting with the uncertainty and challenges of living, which was, you know, even 10, 12, 12,000 years ago, there were saber tooth tigers floating around this joint. Okay. And they, it was, it was a dangerous world. Um, and you know, I, you know, I walk through my woods around my house all the time and I just haven't seen a tiger, you know, um, I've seen a lot of deer, you know, I've seen a lot of rabbits. I've seen, I've seen a lot of squirrels, but, uh, a dangerous animal. Nah. And yet 10, 12,000 years ago, um, walking through the woods was a, was an in interesting affair. And that emotional brain of yours, that caveman brain of yours, I uh, cannot separate the, uh, psychological discomfort of embracing uncertainty and the biological threat that our ancestors had about uh, uncertainty. And that's the big deal is that um, you have to be willing to face that fear in order to master it. That's the, that's the self-development angle. And what a lot of people discover about my work is that um, in many ways, trading is incidental to my work. 
is I'm actually teaching you how to develop a mind. It's really self-development. It just has a specialty of recognizing that trading is unlike most professions, most endeavors there is, is that you can't fake it. You can't, you can't self-deceive. Well, I guess you can as long as you have enough money to continually lose, but you can't self-deceive for long. That instant karma of your of your PL is gonna tell you really quick. And so to me, in trading, there's really no choice but to face your fears. And we as traders have to become we have to develop that courage to be able to face the fear with the intention of mastering it, not conquering it beating it up and making it go away, but actually mastering it. Mastering it so that the mind that you're bringing to the management uncertainty is not a fear-based mind anymore. It's a curiosity-based mind. Very powerful stuff, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Um, so from seeing lots of different traders of lots of different levels, do you think that anyone can be profitable with the right education? Hmm. Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, the answer is no. Uh, in my practice, my individual practice, uh, I estimate that about 30% of the people I work with become consistently profitable. And I would, I'd like to say 90% and stuff like that. But, uh, if, you know, the, uh, the numbers are there and, you know, a lot of this is self-report when, when I'm working with them and having them give me information. So I'm assuming that um, I'm, I'm assuming I'm getting fairly reliable information. But um, it's kind of like um, some people just constantly what people really want to do, they come to me and what they're looking for is the magic bullet they're they're looking for the magic knowledge that I'm going to impart into them that's going to change their lives. And they're, they're thinking literally that if I just have this technique, if I just have this word of wisdom, then my, the way I manage the mind that I bring to trading will be all, all better then. Whereas I look at it and go, no, that you are, you are literally changing. You're changing an organic substrate in your brain. That's what you're, that's what you're doing. You're, uh, you're taking an organic process and you are literally deconstructing that neural pathway that, and you are reconstructing it. Uh, and that, that's, you know, from a biological standpoint, that takes time. It takes effort and it takes a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of learning, uh, a lot of reps. Okay. And it's not magic. It, it's, it's kind of like that we earn our money the old fashioned way, hard work. It, you have to commit yourself to changing the way the brain engages uncertainty. And that's, that's what, uh, that's what continually amazes me is people, they, they get on this stuff and they will, um, they know that they've got homework. They know that they're going to be seeing me and, um, they do it just before they meet me. So that, Oh, I've done my homework. I've done this. I've done these. Blah, blah, blah. That's not the point. You know, that's, that's, that's high school. You know, that's doing your homework just for class. Now we're, we're actually, we're actually talking about a continuous process of where you are training yourself and recognizing, um, it's going to take somewhere between six months and a year. If you really commit yourself to the process to be able to change the way the beliefs that drive how you interact with uncertainty. So, that's the main thing is uh, self-honesty and the motivation uh, to say, I'm willing to change. Yeah. I'm willing to change. Yeah. Um, do you trade yourself? No, I don't. I don't. I have no interest at all. Um, and people I work with could care less if I trade or not. What they realize is that uh, I understand the brain on uncertainty and um that's what they're that's what they're hiring me for that's why they're reading me that's why they're following me is i have uh, a unique understanding of how that process works and um, i'm completely fascinated by it and i would get i cannot just imagine sitting in front of a screen for hours on end and learning learning uh, a system 
uh, a language that I'm not interested in learning. And a long time ago, I learned that um, just doing something because it could make a lot of money is not necessarily a very good idea at all. That I, I, uh, I have enormous passion for what I do. I just love this stuff. And to me, to me, um, you know, traders are just a laboratory that I have been enormously blessed to have. And I get to play, I get to play and learn how to build um, the way the mind engages in certainty. And it's just, that's what fascinates me. And um, I, um, like I said, I, long time ago, I learned that uh, follow your passions. Uh, making money will find a way to show up. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and is there anyone inside of outside of trading that you look up to? Oh, God, yeah. Um, 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 outside of trading, to be honest with you, one of the biggest heroes I, I can ever imagine is Winston Churchill. Um, I looked at, uh, you know, that man literally put not just Britain on his back, but he, from my standpoint, he put the whole world on his back and carried it for a while, particularly when the, when the Germans were, were bombing London and stuff like that. And to this day, I have a box upstairs, upstairs by my bed that has never, never, never give up. And that's a, a famous speech from Winston Churchill that he gave at Cambridge. And he literally, he came up with this little that top hat of his and he unfolded this little speech. He put it down and that's all the speech was. And he, he spoke it, you know, there's about 2000 people out there. And then, then he got off the stage, came back and he said, I mean it, he said it again. And he walked off. And what I realized is, you know, something that, that, um, that man, literally they, they called him the bulldog for a reason and that guy that guy was resilient that guy that re, that guy absolutely refused to give up and he got he got stalin and roosevelt to be able to work together which is beyond my wildest dreams uh and 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 defeated probably the best military the world has ever seen you know it's for, uh, and George Soros is a guy that I have enormous respect for too, is that um, if you read, you know, you, you know, all, uh, all the conspiracy junk and all like that aside, I could, you know, that's not, that's not, that's just simply conspiracy theory to me. But when you, when you take a look at his life, when you take a look at, um, he actually, um, there was an interview that I heard with him and where he's he'd just made two billion dollars had written a book about it was during the financial ordeal of 2008 and he began to talk about uh, market bubbles and he made this observation uh, he says you know the markets are just like nature if you know how to observe nature you realize the relationship is direct between what happens in the markets and what happens in nature and he said first you have to get past the notion that nature is bucolic and it's just a wonderful thing and it's just beautiful no it's highly competitive there's bubbles happening all the time and he gave the example of um of a, a rodent in alaska called the alaskan vole that has these uh explosive population of bubbles that happen where they just multiply like crazy to the point where all the predators basically they can just open their mouth and and these rodents jump in their mouth and they're just everywhere and then suddenly, within like a year or two, the entire population crashes. And a lot of, there's a lot of starving going on and stuff like that. And he gave the example of that. He says, I am both an observer and a participant in the markets. He says, the problem is, is that as an observer, my job is to look for bubbles. And then he said, I've become pretty good at observing for bubbles. The problem is, is I'm also a participant in the market and I can't simultaneously be the participant and the observer at the same time. But he said, what I've done is I've learned how to put the, the participant and the observer in an intimate dance with one another so that they can inform each other. And he said, in this particular, in this particular position that I made this $2 billion on, 
I came to the moment of where the bubble was really unstable and I decided to take my money and he made the joke and you know, two billion dollars is not a bad day's haul, you know? And, uh, and he said at the same time, ultimately I rec I recognized that I left a billion dollars on that table. But the key is, is I didn't know when the bubble was going to break and I didn't want to be around when the bubble popped. And he's, and he just, and he said something, it, you know, you, at first you listen to it, you go, is this guy arrogant? But no, he, he's not. He just simply said, you know, what will happen is I will just simply go and find another bubble and I'll make that billion dollars. And he said it just as matter of factly is that uh, of like, you know, my wife and I having a conversation and she's going to go and get some sandwiches and bring them back to home. Just ordinary talk, no big deal, just the fabric. But what he's done is he has created um, the capacity of observing. Now, his observing is also really intuitive because, you know, his body, he'll start getting back aches, he'll start all that when he needs to be out of position. So there's a level of intu intuition in his trading in his uh, portfolio management that um, probably the rest of us are not. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever become George Soros. Is, but the thing is, you look at the $24 billion he can give away and you realize, oh, he has at least $24 billion to be able to give away and still live really high on odds. But I have enormous respect for uh, for him. I really do. It's uh, um, I, I, I don't. He's, he's developed the concept of the observer and basically marshalling what mind is showing up at any particular time. And he's recognizing that there, there is a separation between the participant and the observer, but they can learn to work together. And that's exactly what I teach. So I have great admiration for him. Hmm. And I have one last question. Sure. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say? And also, where can people find you? Okay. Well, what I'd really like to say more than anything else is, is there's an acceptance at the very moment the door to um, growing really opens up. And when uh, a trader recognizes the brain they brought to trading is not going to be the brain that produces success in trading. And it's no fault of your own. Okay. This is evolutionary psychology. It's just that the brain's built for something very different than you're asking it to do. Now you're asking a certainty based survival instinct brain to act from a probability based mind. And it, it's unless you win the genetics lottery, it's just not going to happen. And you're going to have to train it. However you go doing that, I wish you well. Um, but it's, that's really the, uh, and the main thing is it's not your fault. You don't have to hide from it. You don't have to, you know, you don't, you don't have to worry about somebody discovering it. We're, this is a human condition. That's the brain we bought to the game. And it may have been really successful in other ventures, but when you, when you, when you get into the domain of trading, it's just a different animal and it requires a different brain in mind than the one you brought. That's the main thing I want people to get. It's just not your fault. It's just that, what are you going to do? It's your responsibility to be able to build that mind that can engage the uncertainty in a way that your intellectual edge, your method edge becomes real when, when the capital's real and the losses are real. And getting in touch with me is, uh, it's my website. It's uh, www.mytraderstateofmind.com or if you were to go to YouTube and type in Randy Howell, uh, you'll discover that I've got nearly 200 videos up on, on there and people, people watch those things all day long. Uh, it's just crazy to me, but uh, they, they will watch Randy Howell videos as they trade. And it, it's something that ha they keep reporting that uh, it has been enormously helpful for them in their performance as a trader. And, uh, but I, we, most of the people that I now uh, end up getting to see come off of uh, YouTube because they're, they're, they know they have it. What I like about YouTube is this, is they, the person knows they have a problem. They are seeking an answer. They don't necessarily know that it's Randy Howell, but they're seeking an answer. And as they start looking at all the trader psychologists around, 
they, they discover that my work is rooted in neurobiology uh, and it, it's, a, it's a different animal and it, it appeals to them, to the certain set of people that find my work uh, really interesting. And from there they go to the website and when you go to my website, people park on that thing for hours at a time because there's a lot of free material, there's just a lot of stuff to read access to videos, just all sorts of stuff there. And, and you, you really get to know, um, you really get to know my teachings and what I'm actually uh, trying to teach a person versus trying to give them information that's going to make them a better trader. I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I'm basically teaching them to do brain surgery on themselves. And, uh, that's, that's, that's the way you would, uh, and, um, the other thing is, uh, I would get my book, Mindful Trading, um, and what it does is it pretty much lays out the process uh, that I use. I teach a process. When you work with me, you're just not going to talk to me about whatever is showing up in your trading. I am. We are going to learn a process, and it starts out emotional regulation to mindfulness to beginning to understand the mind as a community of powerful emotional programs that are duking it out. And learning how to start managing what emotional programs are showing up to create the mind that engages uncertainty. It's just, um, I found that the process works. And if you do the homework, if you do the work, uh, I know what's going to happen. I see, I see the improvement going on. But it starts with understanding. I teach a process. I, I don't, uh, and as we as you grow yeah we we start looking at specific areas in your trading performances and we start rec learning how to deconstruct the problem areas and reconstruct them into much more powerful ways performing in the moment mm. yeah i mean that's the psychology of it is just a massive benefit for traders um so yeah i i think oh necessary not it's just not beneficial yeah. it's necessary yeah and a lot of a lot of a lot of guys don't figure that out till they've drained all their capital. Mm. So, but well, that's that's part of natural selection. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for coming onto the podcast today. Um, it's been really good. It's been fun. 